Good evening and welcome. I'm Ellen Eisman, a library trustee for a decade and a half, and happily a longtime neighbor of our speaker tonight, Michael Kimmelman, who will talk about his new book, The Intimate City, Walking New York, and then take questions and sign his book in the Peluso Family Gallery. As has been written on his book jacket, Michael is the architecture critic of the New York Times. He was the paper's chief art critic and from Berlin created the Abroad column covering politics and culture across Europe and the Middle East. He's reported from more than 40 countries and founded Headway, a nonprofit journalistic initiative focused on global challenges and paths to progress. A native New Yorker, Michael is a twice winning finalist of the Pulitzer Prize and the author of the accidental masterpiece on the art of life and vice versa and portraits talking with artists at the Met, the Modern, the Louvre and elsewhere. As New York came to a halt with COVID, Michael composed an email to a group of architects, historians and writers and friends inviting them to take a walk. Wherever they liked, he wrote, preferably someplace meaningful to them, someplace that illuminated the city and what they loved about it. At first, the goal was distraction. At a scary moment when everything seemed uncertain, walking around New York served as a reminder of all the ways the city was still a rock, joy, and inspiration. What began with a lighthearted trip to explore Broadway's shuttered theater district and a stroll along Museum Mile where the museums were closed soon took on a much larger meaning and ambition. These intimate, funny, richly detailed conversations between Michael and his companions became anchors for millions of Times readers during the pandemic. Please join me in welcoming my very old, longtime neighbor, Michael Kimmelman. Thank you, Ellen. That's very kind, except for the stuff about being old, but that's all right. <laughs> I can. Yeah, <laughs> so, thank you all for coming out <clears throat> this um, late afternoon. And um, let me begin by saying here we are, um, gathered together in a room, something that we couldn't do a couple years ago, and certainly three years ago when this project began. Um, I think we, you know, we've now gotten to a point where we kind of almost take this for granted again, but I, I think we shouldn't. Um, there's something very uh, profound and moving about the fact that we can do this, and we saw how important it was to come together, I think, um, during COVID, <coughs> and how, um, how much the city actually is a place of um, shared um, space and shared responsibility, something that we um, appreciate precisely because we are all uh, doing it together. Um, so as Ellen said, you know, I was, um, this book began because like everybody else, you know, I suddenly found myself at home in a state of some panic, but also um, because I wanted to figure out how I could make myself useful. Um, and I realized I wouldn't be able to do my job in a normal way, things were shutting down. So what is it that I could do? And in those very early days, um, I thought, well, it's still possible to go outside and look around the city. And in fact, um, that might be the most interesting time to see it. I had done, as, as Ellen mentioned, a book years ago called Portraits, which began um, also as a project for the Times. As the art critic at that point, I didn't feel comfortable sort of hanging out with artists. Um, because it just seemed like a natural conflict of interest. So I wanted to cook up a way to spend time with artists I admired so I could pick their brains. Um, and um, so I can contrived this scheme to walk around with them in the Metropolitan Museum, uh, artists I had already written about and felt comfortable with. Um, and you know, I, when I first got that job, I was really very young and I had no right to have that job and I was just spent years trying not to make a complete idiot of myself in public. So I just, I, I really genuinely wanted to uh, learn from artists, but I also um, 
came to believe, uh, it's a trained art story, and I, I really came to believe that um, there is no single correct way to look at art, and that many people, when they think about uh, art, to feel somehow intimidated or ill-equipped to know what they're looking at. Um, and so they, we, you know, sort of attach ourselves to labels or feel that we need to read something or be told something. Um, but I, I knew th enough to know that artists are extremely selfish and particular about the way they look at art. Um, and so that if people could hear the way artists see art and see that artists see the same art differently, then they would understand that they themselves have the right and the ability to just open their eyes and look. Um, so the scheme began by asking some artists to go around the Metropolitan Museum with me uh, with the idea that Rashomon like we would look at the same place but they would all look at it differently and thereby make clear that there is no single correct way to look. Um, but then artists had sort of caught on for a while and so artists began to sort of ask to do this and then ask to do different things. Richard Serra wanted to look at stuff in uh, the Museum of Modern Art and Jake Lawrence wanted to do that and then Lucy and Freud wanted to go around the National Gallery in London and Balthus in Switzerland. It was great, great for me and it sort of came apart a little bit. But that idea of, of portraits was in my head because of course that is the city too. There is no single right way to look at the city. We all compose the city. We are all, as it were, the artists making the city in our own ways. And that if I could go around with people uh, to the city, we could see, first of all, in lots of different neighborhoods that many people, even New Yorkers, native New Yorkers like me, and maybe many of you, have never bothered to look at. Um, but also to understand that the city is made by different people in different ways. It's not simply a collection of buildings designed by a bunch of architects or buildings designed by a bunch of architects and engineered by a bunch of engineers, but it's the cumulative effect of generations, really centuries of people, working people, um, people who were in government, community activists, so just everybody in a different way. And that maybe I could put together a portrait, as it were, of New York that was a tiny little fraction of a representation of what makes the city. So that was in my head, and I sent out the email on, I think, March 13th. I could look up the day, just that day when Cuomo announced that the, um, the city was shutting down. Broadway theaters had closed. Um, museums along, mus all museums, but all Museum Mile had shut down too. So the first thing I did was to um, organize with uh, David Rockwell, who is an architect, uh, runs a big practice that specializes in a lot of interiors, and David has done many of the restaurants, hotels, and other public venues that you know, but he's also done a lot of, he's won many Tonys and done a lot of plays on Broadway. And David um, said he'd love to look around Broadway. So we met on 42nd Street and 8th Avenue, around the corner from where I work. Um, it was, as you may recall, uh, if you stepped out at that moment, one of the weirdest, <laughs> scariest, most fascinating times to be in the city. Um, 42nd Street in the middle of the morning on that weekday had David and me, keeping what we thought was a distance, I guess. Um, and then uh, two characters dressed, in one in an Elmo costume, one I think in Superman costume, waiting, you know, lounging by the uh, the subway exit on 42nd Street, hoping some mark would walk up the steps in vain, of course. There was a hot dog salesman and three clearly bewildered Italian tourists walking down the street. And that was it. Absolutely it. Nothing. Nowhere. And we proceeded to look around at these theaters. David had sort of um, prepared a long sort of tour for us <laughs> about the history of the theaters and the history of the neighborhood, um, and some of which I knew and some of which I didn't, of course. Um, and I have to say, it was really an extraordinary moment because it was, in a way, the greatest time ever to look at New York. Um, 
when else can you wander through Times Square with no one in it, um, <laughs> in the daylight? And, uh, you know, a lot of what we do when we move through the city is not look at what's around us. Um, and I, I totally understand that. Uh, Ellen mentioned that I was in Europe for some years. Um, I'll just take a little detour to say that I based myself in Berlin, uh, but I tr traveled all over Europe and the Middle East and elsewhere too. Um, and um, it was, it, reporters know this, it's one of the great privileges of being um, ignorant that you see things with fresh eyes. Um, you know what this is like. So for instance, in Berlin, I noticed there was a bookstore right down the, you know, in the street below our apartment, and there were a couple of others up the block, and another near my office, and so forth. And these were all small, independent booksellers. And I wondered at that time, this is now 15 years ago, how, how is it that there are so many independent bookshops in Berlin, and New York's were closing? Interestingly, they were opening again, but it's another story. At that time, they were shutting down. And I thought, what's going on here? So I started to ask my new German uh, acquaintances, later good friends, um, why do you have so many bookstores? To which their reaction was, what the hell are you talking about? Because for them, it was entirely normal. And um, that was the point. They'd seen these all the time, and I took it for granted. But because I knew nothing, it was to me novel. And I began to ask around, and it opened up a really interesting point, which is that uh, after the war in West Germany, um, it was important for the West German um, uh, officials to reestablish a sense of civilization. Um, and so they established certain uh, regulations. One was, this came a little bit later, but that you couldn't undercut, you couldn't discount prices. You would never have the equivalent of a Walmart or Barnes & Noble undercutting all the small bookshops. Um, and um, that the any bookshop anywhere would be guaranteed um, the book that someone requested the next day. Um, so that, again, a big shop could not, you know, basically outdo a little shop by having a much larger inventory, among other things. So a friend of mine I met from West Germany pointed out that when she was growing up in this small town, um, she remembered in the early morning very early, that um, there would be an ambulance that would come to town. This was in the Ruhr Valley. And the ambulance would carry drugs to the drugstore and books to the bookstore. <laughs> it's a very beautiful thought. <laughs> yeah? I mean, drugs for the body, books for the mind. It was So out of that ignorance came this kind of, um, you know, lesson about the aspirations, at least, of West Germany in the years after the war. Um, and I remember the point at which I went to Paris pretty often. And um, I remember the time that I um, left my house and arrived at one of the hotels I, I stayed in Paris and walked into the hotel and realized that I'd done it without noticing or thinking. And I thought, it's time to go. <laughs> um, and so I get back to my point, which was that, you know, what does it take for us to open our eyes and see what is in front of us? Um, it's part of the same point I was trying to make in portraits, but I think in a city it's um, at once easier um, and much more difficult. Easier because everything is right there. You're not necessarily expecting that you're supposed to see anything in particular or know anything in particular. Um, but at the same time, we're constantly distracted and there are a million reasons why we are not stopping and looking. Um, so one of the reasons I want to do a walk was that I think that when we walk, we, when we really are walking, um, we experience a place very differently, right? You, I mean, you know, you can walk quickly, of course, but generally when you walk, in the sense of 
sort of taking a walk, <laughs> you you begin to experience the city physically, right? So you begin to experience the way that the avenue blocks are much longer than the blocks, the numbered blocks. The way there's a slight grade on the street, whether it's up or down. Um, you remember where there are certain smells or the way the light comes through particular space between two buildings. Um, and, you know, we all, I think, take in the city unconsciously. There are walks that we enjoy. There are walks that we avoid. Um, but that notion of actually walking is, I think, also part of owning the city. When you actually walk a place and you, you feel like you have kept your eyes open or absorbed it, you, I think, on some level believe you possess it. Why do we go touring places? Why do we spend a fortune and endure TSA lines and sit in those horrible seats in order to go to Paris to walk through the seventh? It's because once you've done that, on some level you believe that now the seventh is yours. Not everything about it, but it's the closest you can come to sort of having some ownership of a place. I mean that in the best sense, you know, the sense that a city is a place that we all can somehow claim. And I think that's the other thing I wanted to convey in the book that, and I believe it's very true, it, it informs my work, that the city of New York, above all other cities, is a truly cosmopolitan place. Cosmopolitanism is this notion of a diversity of different people coming together around this idea of a common shared endeavor in a common shared place. We're, we're, we're together, which means that we have to deal with each other. Um, and we negotiate that togetherness all the time. In a, in a sense, the city is by its nature the most democratic undertaking we've ever attempted because we have to constantly be mindful of each other and find ways to exist together. And so for me, that idea that we go to different places in order on some level to share them is this very beautiful idea, really, about what, um, what our aspirations are as a civilization, that, that, that what we mean when we talk about democracy, what we mean when we talk about diversity. Um, and I think New York embodies that. I speak this as a native, you know, biased person but embodies it as much or more than any other city in the sense that I think New York is a, a place that, so look, I mean, we're, we all came from someplace else, I assume almost all of us, if not all of us. Um, so that is a nature of our country. It's the most beautiful and in some ways the most contested aspect of our country. Um, but New York especially, I think, is a place that embraces and represents that openness. Um, I don't know how many, how many of you are actually native, born and raised in New York City? It's not a test, it's just a, I figured there were a bunch of us here. So I will say this, you may not agree, but I, I really mean it, and I wrote it in the book too. I, I'm totally good if somebody who arrived yesterday uh, declares themselves a New Yorker today. I'm totally good with that. I'm fine. That doesn't mean they have a clue. But, but I, I'm, I'm good if they consider them as New Yorker. I agree that they are New Yorkers. It's a, it's a thing we can all cl claim to be. Um, you know, I lived in Berlin. I, I could not ever claim to be a German any more than I could claim to be a cucumber. Um, it just, it's just it's a question of blood and heritage, and that's it. I could, you know, say that I lived there a long time, but on some fundamental level, one is always an outsider. I, love Germany and love Germans. I don't mean that in a bad way at all. I think this is a thing about New York City and it's one of our greatest, if not our greatest asset. So I wanted to convey that too um, by looking around the city. I'll just say, you know, it began, as Ellen said, as a kind of lark um, and a make work for me. Um, and then it sort of, sort of caught on, and I kind of liked it too. And, and I began to think, okay, there is something uh, 
larger at work here. And then I began to think, okay, well, what does represent the city? It's infinite, so I could go to any neighborhood anywhere. Um, and there are literally millions of people I could walk around with. So how do I do this? So <clears throat> if you're interested and you look at the book, you'll see I try to pick a variety of people. Obviously, I lean towards architects and designers um, because originally the book was about the physical fabric of the city, and it, it fundamentally is. But I walk around with a guy who does land use law and a community organizer in Mott Haven, and I walk around with Andrew Dokart, who did the, um, uh, the National um, Monument for Stonewall and talk about um, the gay village. I, I'm a villager, and so I wanted to learn that too. I didn't really know that history, even though it was all around me. Um, I went with Suketu Mehta, who many of you may know or know of, my friend who um, grew up partly in Jackson Heights. Um, and for Suketa, as for my friend Lucy Sant, the, the, talking about the East Village, these really became memoirs. Um, they weren't descriptions so much of the current neighborhood as descriptions of their memories of the neighborhoods that had existed. Um, and I think that's also crucial to understanding the way a city works, which is that it is a palimpsest of our collective memories. Um, and it registers in all these different ways. In their case, of course, it registers in literary forms, um, uh, those memories, and not just in physical buildings or streets or plans or landscapes or whatever. Um, and I, in some, I'll, I'll admit that I, I sort of love those, those chapters um, a lot. But in some ways, the most fun was um, to go around with Eric Sanderson. Eric is a, he looks like Santa Claus, um, and he's much nicer than Santa Claus. Um, he is now at the Bronx Zoo, I guess, but he was at, um, was it the Nature Conservancy? Anyway, he's, anyway, he's an environmental scientist and um, environmental historian, and he wrote a remarkable book called Manahatta, um, and Eric's project was essentially, he came across a map of um, Manhattan uh, during the end of the British. The British made this very detailed map uh, in order to figure out how to, during the war. Um, and so what he thought he could do is overlay that map on what is there now, but also look up all the ecologies and uh, flora and fauna, to sort of trace that to sort of map the city that used to exist. So I, my scheme was I met Eric um, at the, um, basically the South, South Ferry. Um, we stood on the edge of the city and stared out at the water, the harbor, pretending it was 1609 and Henry Hudson's ship was coming through and we, we were, you know, like the Lenape, no idea what was about to happen. And I asked him, okay, what was the, what would we have seen? What was the city like? And then we sort of began to talk about how the city had evolved and we ended up almost going back to the, you know, um, Big Bang. Um, and, but we were talking about the sort of glacial history of the city and why there are heights and um, I, it was just, it was incredibly interesting. It was interesting in a, a few ways. Eric, I'll just say, comes from the West and um, had spent his time and got interested in geology because he'd been walking through Yosemite and studying a lot of the national parks and he found that kind of landscape so moving. Um, the enormous heights of mountains and the eccentricities of flora and fauna and so forth. Um, Eric's a wonderful New Yorker. Um, he's, he's really attached to and understands what the ecologies were like that are no longer here. But he's not chastising us, he's just, um, he's actually a great fan of the great heights of buildings we have built and the eccentricities of the millions of people who have come here. Essentially, he's, he understands that we've replaced one kind of ecological landscape with, with another. And I think that's um, um, a very beautiful thing, too. But in talking to Eric, there was one anecdote which I wanted to relate to you, and you'll see it if you look through the book in the chapter on Manahatta. By the way, we did another walkthrough, because 
people really liked it and I liked it and he liked it, through the Bronx. Um, he lives on City Island and, um, and he works at the Bronx Botanical Garden. Um, but so we did the Bronx. We started, as it were, in center field in Yankee Stadium when it had been a salt marsh. But in, Man in Manhattan, or Manhattan, as the Mafia knew it, um, he pointed out the collect pond. And I wanted to tell you the story of the collect pond now because to me, it is also a parable of progress in the city and the way in which change happens. Um, so the collect pond was the fresh water source for Lenape for, I don't know, a thousand years in lower Manhattan. It's more or less where the courthouses are. Um, and then the Dutch arrived and then the English arrived and then they started to colonize all of lower Manhattan. And we can talk if you want um, in question and answer about whatever you'd like, but I'm happy to go into some details about neighborhoods or stuff, um, including lower Manhattan. But um, what happened as the population grew is it began to occupy the areas around the collect pond and industries started to grow in, the, in lower Manhattan. Industries like tanneries, and tanneries need to be near some sort of water source, so tanneries began to locate themselves during the early American days around the collect pond. Tanneries, as some of you may know, are not only the most horrifying, smelling, disgusting places you can imagine, but are incredibly toxic. So effectively, the early Americans polluted their only fresh water source in lower Manhattan. So in those early years, um, the colonists were constantly dying of cholera. There were, there were plagues and outbreaks of disease all the time because the water was polluted, um, toxic. So a, a, a plan was cooked up to, um, to fix that by, by f creating a new sort of sewer system um, that would bring water from a, a more distant source. And this was the plan by Aaron Burr. But Burr said that he couldn't do this unless he could finance and he needed to raise money. So he said he needed permission to create a bank, essentially. And then the bank would have this money and would use the money to finance it. Okay, so you know, Burr really had only one desire and that was to create a bank. Um, so the sewage system he created, the water system he created was a nightmare. It, it didn't work, it leaked, and it caused further outbreaks of cholera. So that was a total failure. Um, it was such a failure that it required more drastic measures. And so the city eventually realized it had to draw water from a much more distant source, the Croton Reservoir, and create an aqueduct system about 50 miles long. And that that water needed to come down and then be kept in various reservoirs, which needed to create spaces in the city for those reservoirs. So creating a space, for instance, in what is now Central Park, um, the Great Lawn, and what is now the 42nd Street Library. Um, and, uh, and so that, in turn, allowed for the development of Manhattan far from lower Manhattan into much more distant reaches. Essentially what I'm saying is the, the polluting of the collect pond, the corruption of Aaron Burr, and the failure of the next system of plumbing he created eventually gave us the New York as we know it, with Central Park, with neighborhoods, and with the 42nd Street Library, and with neighborhoods developed all the way up uh, into the Bronx and um, even farther north. So it allowed for the expansion of the city. We are here because of the Croton Reservoir as well. Um, and by the way, that bank is now J.P. Morgan Chase. <laughs> the world's largest bank. So what did that do? That, that little action um, of putting tanneries along the side of the collect pond ultimately led to the creation of New York as the financial capital <laughs> of the world and a city that could produce the grid, which took, by the way, about 100 years to complete. So the other thing I'll just put in your head is all of this took place over generations the grid itself, which was proposed in 1811, was finished around the turn of the 20th century, a little bit afterwards, which means that it was started when New York was still farmland, 
and it was completed during the era of the automobile and the skyscraper. We have trouble building a single new apartment building without or removing a parking space without all hell breaking loose, much less committing to projects that would take a century. But I think one of the other things about the city it tells us is that progress is a complicated, multi-generational, um, you know, not straight line. Um, and that our expectations um, have to be a little different than they have become. I think we've become much more accustomed to a cycle of reward or whatever the hell it is we're doing on social media, um, you know, that's 24 seven. But also think of things that are larger than ourselves um, and think beyond ourselves. Um, it's very hard to do. Climate change is obviously you know, another example of how difficult that is for many people to think about, um, to rationalize. Um, I think I'll get back to walking just to say, you know, if you're really walking, of course, I walk around with my earbuds in and listen to podcasts or music or whatever. But on some level, if you're really walking and taking things in, you're, the pace of absorption is also different. And I think that's something I also wanted to remind people of. There was a remark by Kundera I, I quoted. I wanted to get it straight. Um, but it, it has to do with the slowness of time. He said, there is a secret bond between slowness and memory. This is, he writes in a book called uh, Slowness. He says, just as there is between speed and forgetting. And I think that's right. I'll just read you these couple of paragraphs. A walker in New York, I, I write, registers topography bodily filling the length of avenue blocks, the slopes of hills and valleys that even the Manhattan grid does not entirely flatten and erase. Walkers grasp the relative height of curbs versus tall buildings, the way sounds and smells, halal carts and garbage trucks, steam pipes and salt air, scent the streets and shape space. To walk the city is to invite the serendipity of coming upon a community garden or the wooden piles of a decrepit pier or spring crocuses pushing through cracked pavement. It is to experience the endless juxtaposition of this with that, which is New York's calling card. To have walked to places also, in some measure, to possess it. During the 19th century, Baudelaire's flaneur wandered Paris's boulevards and the city's gaslit glass and iron arcades to dissect the spaces of modernity. Walking was a means of discovery, an act of social analysis and criticism. Following in Baudelaire's footsteps, Walter Benjamin's flaneur during the 1920s and 30s became a collector of urban details, forming a mental atlas of the city, bearing witness to the mess of detritus and paraphernalia, the spectacle and sensory overload. The flaneurs that Baudelaire and Benjamin conjured up did not rush. A big city like New York may change every second, but it reveals its secrets slowly to the patient, open-eyed, and open-eared observer. Horns honk, history murmurs, the flaneur listens. So I just wanted to say um, what was also really lovely, um, some of you remember the um, you know, pots out the window at 7 o'clock. Um, what were we doing? I mean, we were thanking, obviously, um, the emergency workers and, and hospital workers and others. But I think we were doing something else too, which is letting each other know we were there. We were leaning out the window and noticing there were other people. We weren't alone in the city. And there was this sense, I think, of a shared, um, of, of strength that came from this shared sense that we were going through this thing together. Um, I, I know people left um, and but for me, actually, being in the city was very um, uh, it, it made me feel safer, actually. It made me feel <clears throat> I wasn't alone. Um, I was downstairs. You were downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and I wanted, therefore, the series and, and the book, too, to convey something of the distraction and um, sense of possibility that, um, that I was feeling by, do, by doing this project. So I know the reactions I got were that a lot of this was a relief from the endless 
terror that was the news every day and the sense that something worse was about to happen, um, not just because of COVID, but other stuff you may recall. And, um, um, and I think that was also important to me. You know, I was pressed a lot at that time to write something about what was going to happen to the city. Um, what was going to happen to commercial real estate? What was going to, would people leave the city? Would, you know, what would, <clears throat> I didn't know what was going to happen the next hour. How the hell was I supposed to know? The one thing I did know was that there were a lot of people on TV and elsewhere prognosticating out of sheer ignorance and saying that all hell was going to break loose. And like many of you, I remember that after 9-11, there were all these predictions that no one would ever build, much less live in, another skyscraper again, it is the end of skyscrapers, and of course what followed immediately was the biggest era of skyscraper construction in human history. So I realized that we had absolutely no idea what was going to happen. Um, and I think the, the series and the book was intended partly to be an antidote uh, to that sense of doom scrolling and but also to be a reminder that the city is longer lasting and larger than us um, and that time uh, does not you know, go in uh, hourly segments only, but that there is a, a time scale that the city tells us about all the time if we look that on some ways is also a, a relief. And here we are um, three years later. Um, and that I think is not to be taken for granted, as I said at the beginning. Um, I think it's, it's, um, it's easy to forget we are a collective society of amnesiacs and, um, and we're easily distracted. But I think the lessons of the city as well as the pandemic uh, are that we, um, we're also extraordinarily resilient um, and that things change and not always for the worse, so. Thanks. I'll, I'll take any questions you've got. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Oh, you mean there are holes, or you mean well, what are you talking about? Building buildings, but oh, yeah. there's such. I think it's 46th Street, then 44th Street. Yeah. Um, going up Madison, you know, there, these are people had to get rid of the people who live there. But through the, you know, all the. Uh, yeah. So uh, and now, did they have it before COVID, or right. you know, it just I find it amazing, and I was somewhat in the real estate situation here so. Right. Um. Well, uh, it's hard to know because you're talking very generally, right? I mean, the, um, there's been a lot of construction in recent years because the city um, has been flush. Um, you know, uh, now, of course, it's going to be more difficult to do certain kinds of construction. Um, so there's always a time lag between when um, you see things going up and when the original plans to build those things happened and then when they finished, you know, these projects often take time. So that's one thing to say. Uh, and I assume not everything you're talking about was a residential building that has been torn down to build another residential building. Some of them, especially along, I don't know where you're talking about on Madison, but uh, you know, a lot of, um, these are commercial real estate ventures. Um, and the, those are, as I say, you know, um, n now in limbo, which is not great for the city. Um, you know, developers are interesting people. We, you know, there's a, they come in different forms. And, um, you know, there's often a lot of feeling that developers are just greedy people who are um, trying to, you know, bilk us out of, as much money as they can. Um, I saw a building yesterday uh, that's going up in Brooklyn. Developer put um, $100 million in cash into this 
you know, commercial real estate venture. It's, it's a remarkable building. I probably won't write about it, but it's remarkable. That's, that's taking a lot of risk um, in order to build something um, that he believes is going to ultimately be good for the city and also make him a buck. So when we need developers to build housing, because we got out of the public housing business um, as a nation, um, so I'm not against the fact that there's more stuff being built. And the truth is we have an extraordinary housing shortage in New York. So, you know, I'm hearing in your voice a little bit, and I, please correct me if I'm wrong, some concern that people were kicked out to build these new things. Um, and that may be the case in some areas in, in, in our neighborhood. Um, there's some luxury housing going up on Broadway that involved tearing down or kicking out quite a number of people to build a much fewer number of high-end luxury apartments. That's not helpful um, at all. On the other hand, you know, uh, there's a lot of development in the city now which we really need, um, especially for the so-called affordable housing. Um, and that's become increasingly difficult to do for lots of reasons. So we could be having another discussion. We could have put it a different way. Why is there not much, much more housing uh, going up around the city when we have 65,000 homeless people and many people, you know, living in, in precarious <laughs> circumstances and, and so forth. Um, and I'm happy to have that conversation too. Uh, I, I think that's probably the most serious problem we face as a city is our inability <clears throat> to build enough of that sort of housing uh, rapidly enough. Yeah. Um, is it inability or what, what do you do for that? Well, what, 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 why can't we? Why, you mean, why can't we build more? Why aren't we? I mean, so, you know, again, we're talking generally. I'm talking more specifically about um, housing for middle and, middle and low income um, New Yorkers. Uh, there are a whole series of reasons why we can't. Some of them are understandable. Um, there's not a lot of land available um, to build large-scale projects. That sounds weird, but it's true. It isn't that there isn't any land. I mean, there's a, uh, for instance, I was thinking the other day, there's a golf course in, in the Bronx. Yes. <laughs> managed by somebody who's, I'm forgetting. Um, that's still enough land to build many thousands of apartments. But, um, but back here on planet Earth, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a, there is a, there's some of that issue. But what's the real issue? The real issue is that um, the financial mechanisms to build <coughs> affordable housing um, are complex. Um, they're not a lot of developers who are um, involved in it. The, there's an enormous, there are enormous regulatory obstacles um, that we've created. Um, there are a number of people who have weaponized environmental legislation um, to make any kind of new construction to delay or derail any kind of new construction. Um, that's a fundamental NIMBY thing. Um, people like their neighborhoods very often the way they are, uh, uh, or they fear that change will be worse for them. This is not something we New Yorkers used to feel, by the way. Um, you know, the city used to tear down buildings and put up new ones, and the assumption was not that things would be worse. We tore down some great buildings, um, and we put up some great buildings. <laughs> Um, but now I think, and it's been for a long time, a kind of presumption that anything that comes down is going to be replaced by something worse or replaced by something, especially in underserved neighborhoods, that will displace uh, people, make those neighborhoods less affordable. So our conversations around this are sclerotic. Um, they, um, our, our bureaucracy is broken. Um, the financing of these projects is really difficult. Albany, as some of you may or may not have been paying attention, uh, just failed to do anything 
on housing in, in New York State, um, anything, uh, even though everyone agrees that there's a problem. And that was a problem both from the right and the left. Um, so there are no tenant protections. There are no tax incentives now for developers to do affordable housing, even for projects that have been agreed to. This is an extremely dangerous situation. And you know everyone believes that if they're if they're the NIMBY in question, they're not a NIMBY. There's a good reason why they don't want something. But look, the, the neighborhood that Al and I are in, just up the block, there is a residence for single moms, um, just at 83rd Street. Around the corner, there's a residence for formerly homeless seniors. Um, there's public housing two blocks away on Amsterdam Avenue. A lot of it. We live in what is one of the wealthiest neighborhoods now in the city, by far. We're the safest, wealthiest, whitest neighborhoods in the city. And there are also projects for black and brown people and projects for formerly homeless and projects. It, it's fine. We could use more of it in our neighborhood. So I don't believe that there's any neighborhood that well-to-do neighborhood that cannot absorb more development. This the city. I just talked to you for an hour about how the city is a collective undertaking, a shared endeavor. We have to constantly remind each other that we're doing this together. If it's just a bunch of us richer people living in a city, no one's going to be there at the grocery store during COVID to sell you a banana or drive that ambulance or beat your nurse. I mean, this is not the way a city functions. So, you know, I don't mean to sound preachy, but we, we somehow confused the idea that um, preservation and neighborhood sort of character is, is so sacrosanct that nothing can disturb it. And the final answer to your question is, for many reasons, most of them racist, um, we, by the Reagan administration, got out of all public housing. So um, the only way we can build housing is through private development, usually getting private developers to agree to do some percentage of so-called affordable housing. So no wonder we're running out of affordable housing. Um, but it's unsustainable. If you look at the graph, the Furman Center at NYU showed me this recently, study income levels have essentially remained flat accounting for inflation since the 19, late 70s, 1980, since late 70s. Um, and the cost of housing has gone up 20 times. So, I mean, that, there it is. Like, that's not possible. There's a reason why you think, I want me to. Um, you know, it's really becoming difficult to live here. Um, and not just here, but in many other American cities. So, you know, we have to fix the system, but we have to begin by saying that we need to do this together. So, yeah. So, in the last couple of years, my wife and I started taking longer walks in New York, partly as a result of the pandemic. And something that I've been surprised to learn is that there are just huge swaths of the city that were very close to places I had been, but I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. And that's because they were between subway lines. You look at right. Manhattan, especially, you get a sense of the subway being ubiquitous, although it's going to cost a lot of that much. And in Queens and Brooklyn, there are just enormous swaths of the city between the subway lines. I, I just didn't know what they looked like. Yeah. I right. was delighted to learn on a recent walk from uh, Bed Stuy to Astoria. Right. This beautiful oh, cemetery, nice. Mount Zion Cemetery, yeah. in which there's a glorious view of yep. the Manhattan skyline yeah. that I'm sure very few people who live in Manhattan have seen. Right. And I wonder, I just invite you to talk about how the subway really shapes our yeah. experience, especially in Manhattan, to make people uh, yeah. living in New York City more broadly. But although, you know, when you come back from, say, Berlin or London, it seems pretty shabby as all the transit it does go everywhere, it seems. Yeah. And yet it doesn't. There's more of the city beyond yeah. you know, like walking really and stuff. Now. Yeah, if you want to think about, by the way, the, what New York was and what New York is in terms of our ability to get things done, Subway system is a good place to start. I just did a little film with Ken Burns about the Brooklyn Bridge. It was following up on a film he made some years ago, so we made another film. And I, so the 
that period, when the Brooklyn Bridge was built, for those 15 years, there was the invention, the creation of the trans-oceanic um, cable, the completion of the transatlantic, uh, the transcontinental railway, the building of the Suez Canal, the invention of the light bulb, and um, uh, the telephone. Um, but also the beginning of the New York subway system, um, which were, were systems built out into areas that were still farmland. Um, so they were speculative ventures about a future city um, that was what we would now call transit-oriented development. The idea that you put these subway places and people will go out to them. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you take the Second Avenue subway. Those nice four stops we built. <laughs> one hundred years, right? What one hundred years passed since the first proposal to build that? So something's changed. Fifteen years to build the Brooklyn Bridge, do all that, and one hundred years to build those four um, fine stations. So first, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, there was a guy named Alex Garvin. Does anybody here that ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. New Haven. Yeah, so Alex, Alex taught at Yale, but he also, um, he worked for every city administration since the Lindsay administration in city planning. And he was in charge of the redevelopment of Ground Zero and a lot of other stuff. Um, Alex was a sort of, uh, uh, it was a friend and somebody I consulted from time to time, he's wonderful. Alex grew up in Queens, and um, as a teenager, his recreation was to go to a subway station he'd never been to before and just get out and walk around, just explore the city. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many of you hear that and think, oh, that sounds like a cool idea. Just why not on a Saturday, just pick a station, go up. None of you will do it. <laughs> and I don't do it. I mean, I, I've now, because of my job, I've been to many, many, many places in the city I never went before. But you're absolutely right. The subway is the only thing that gets you there. And then you discover that the subway, think about Queens. The seven line is amazing. We've all been to Flushing and you've gone to the tennis center or a Mets game or whatever, and you've been to Astoria. So most of Queens beyond that is, you know, looks like Ohio. <laughs> and, um, you know, how do you even explore it? It tells you just how important mass transit is to the functioning of the city and how inequitable the city is where there is not mass transit. Because what does that mean in terms of getting to a job? You have to either find a bus or you have to have a car or you have, right? And that relates a lot to where we placed, say, public housing. Um, you know, someone is commuting from the distant parts of Queens or or Brooklyn. Bronx is also an issue, but Bronx is complicated in a different way. You're right. So there are a lot of these in, interstices. So I've said a few things in response, but I suppose the, the final thing I should say is what you do is great. Um, and it is fun. I mean, I really enjoyed this a lot. Obviously, I had cool people to go around with, but I mean, how, how many of you have like really wandered around Jackson Heights? You, if you're embarrassed not to say, Jackson Heights is just a wonderful neighborhood. It's just like so cool. It reminds me a little of the village when I was growing up. It's kind of scruffy. It's incredibly like complicated with all these subcultures and great food and great music. And it's just, it's just like, wow, like where did that happen? Um, so that's just one. And there are millions of those neighborhoods around. The, the city is full of a million other cities. So I really do encourage you just to, to do it. I mean, I'm supposed to sell my book, so take the book and <laughs> wander around. But it's, it's really a revelatory. We live in like the most amazing place because it is so concentrated and the subway allows us to get to these places. This is not like London, which is the only other comparable city. Um, and certainly, you know, I mean, there are other amazing places, but New York really is special in its diversity. Yeah. I've read that uh, the commissioners, when they laid out the grid, made an incorrect assumption yeah. that the flow would be from east to west. And for that reason, they situated 
they, they, they align the long blocks east west. And it, you know, I, I mean, I think if they'd done it differently, Manhattan would, might look very, very different if you had the long blocks running. Because yep. it is very frustrating, this long, skinny island when you're trying to walk uptown and every 45 seconds you have to stop for a light. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the early days, first of all, everything was concentrated on the southern end of the island. The idea was that the grid would allow for development, was the greatest real estate decision in the history of humanity. Um, or the worst, depending on how you look at it. Um, but remember that they did that. It wasn't like a guess. What they would, all of all of the industry, all of business, all money, all traffic, everything was in the water. Um, so really, the only thing that did matter was to go from one river to the other, um, and everything needed to travel meaningful travel by water. So that was really fundamentally. What happened, we, we wouldn't really have many reasons to go in 1817 or 25 from Houston Street, or whatever it was called at that time, to 96th Street. It just, that would be crazy, um, unless you lived up there and, and that was where your farm was. So it wasn't so much it was the wrong decision, but the grid is a reflection, as I said, about palimpsests of the way in which the city has evolved. and. Um, you know, that's, we forget, that we, we are here because of the harbor, because this was the greatest natural harbor. Um, and so we were driven by our peers, which used to be like a comb, you know, teeth of a comb on either river. They started on the east side, then that river wasn't deep enough, so they moved to the Hudson. And you had all those piers along the Hudson, 75 or more of them. That stretched up for the you know ocean liners and other things, and then by the end of the Second World War, that that's no longer how the how freight moved. Um, ships had gotten too big. Um, air travel had begun to replace ocean liners. Uh, people were driving. We were completing the um, interstate highway system, and so all of those edges of New York suddenly became derelict um, and that you know we're not going to go through the whole history of New York but that that grid you're describing reflects that early manifestation which then created this life on the edges that disintegrates which then created other opportunities in those broken down places you had art communities develop you had new you had an LGBTQ community which settled in, in places along Christopher Street and elsewhere in the village you know, New York is really interesting because in its lowest moments, supposedly lowest moments, it are also sometimes its most creative ones. Um, and then out of that, we needed to reinvent the waterfront and decide what we wanted to be again. Um, so that's where we are kind of now. Does anybody here remember Westway? Um, Marcy. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have a thing to say about Westway, but I don't know how much time we have, so I'm not sure I should do it. Yeah. So I've lived in Forest Hills for the last seven, eight years. Love Forest Hills. Book, yeah. And I've done a ton of walking. I've probably walked every street in the neighborhood. Great. Uh, I've walked around Jackson Heights, yep. the garden, the flushing, all that stuff. Good. And once COVID hit, you saw the flavor of those walks start to change. Yeah. Because all of a sudden you had people out and exploring and seeing the neighborhood. And, you know, everyone was dying for an escape, so they'd go outside and walk yep. around. Yep. Yep. And now that things have sort of calmed down a little bit, you start to see that change. But I was yeah. just wondering, do you think that sort of attitude of people going out and exploring the world and seeing what's around them, yeah. is that something that's persisting or is it going to fade as sort of we return back to normal? Yeah. COVID I mean, it's over. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, as I say, this is a, con a concern. I, I'm not a prognosticator, so I really don't know. But I do, I do think, you know, we, we do settle back into routines all the time. Right. Um, and, you know, I'm not persuaded that people are going to continue to work remotely. Um, and I'm not really persuaded that, um, you know, people are, who left the city are never coming back, all that sort of thing. Um, but I do fear that you're right. You know, people will just, um, kind of lose touch with what it was they were looking for, um, when they when they were looking outside. 
Um, you know, I remember the very first time, I don't know how many of you felt this, but the very first time I sort of, so I started going around with David, I went, but then I, then it got a little more stressful because lots of people started dying. And I remember fearing going outside. Um, so I was doing this work, but I was also fearful about it. And the people I was meeting were fearful and that, that changed. So overcoming that, and then again, feeling sort of that, that the city was a place that I could explore that, that was very important psychologically to me. And I think to other people as well. Just, I think it's something that people just sort of not aware of. I mean, I yeah. think ourselves and my girlfriend, I told her where I lived originally, and you know, it's, she thinks she thought I lived on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's just allowed people to yeah. get more in touch with the city and their neighborhoods yeah. and a little yeah. further afield. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, what prevented urban renewal from wrecking the damage here in New York City that it did in the Rust Belt, as if you were talking about Ohio and Cleveland and Bateman, yeah. staying in Utica, which where the highways just ran right through the center of town? Uh, we came out relatively unscathed, unless I'm missing something. You're missing something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you wouldn't say that if you lived in the Bronx. Right. Um, or if you lived in many parts of Brooklyn. Um, yeah, um, and, um, you know, I mean, there were plans that were thwarted to run highways uh, through the middle of Manhattan, through my neighborhood, the village. Um, yeah, no, I mean, in fact, um, it was the, the highway system that Robert Moses drove through New York City that, um, allowed people that gave permission essentially to other urban renewal uh, efforts uh, around the country um, and you know I mean if you if you live in Mott Haven um, or parts of the South Bronx you know most of those efforts are called herbicide that's the, the damage there was in just in, incredibly profound um, so no that's that's not really true, but I'll just say, yeah, I'll, I'll, one sec, but I will say, I've obviously thought about a lot about Moses, I, I knew Jane Jacobs. Um, mm -hmm. um, again, I think some historical perspective is always helpful to remember that there is, you know, when Moses started, um, he did some really kind of remarkable things. And then he saw, as did everybody else, that, um, you know, the car was replacing other forms of transportation and that people were moving to suburbs. There were a lot of reasons why that was happening. Some of them racist, some of them to do with the way the United States funded suburban development. Some of them with just a dream of, you know, a backyard and a picket fence. Um, but um, Moses's original desire was to create a highway system that would connect people economically um, to jobs in the city who were coming from outside, and then answered a need uh, for more, you know, cars. It wasn't, as we see it now, just simply ravaging neighborhoods um, and, and polluting them. Um, it became that as he began to see the network, as it were, from 30,000 feet and not understand the way these neighborhoods function, especially poor black and brown neighborhoods. Um, but I mean, the history is important because, um, as I said, progress is something that takes a long time and it evolves and something I think that's seen as progress at one moment is the problem at the next. And we have to, I think, accept that and understand it, that there is no fix, which is the fix, um, but that this is a constant ongoing process. Um, and that's not to reduce the you know damage that, that Moses did, but it's just to sort of say that um, there are reasons why this happened, and not all of them were malicious. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Just, just, you know, just to your point, um, I think Kenneth Jackson writes um, a foreword to this exhibition that was called Robert Wolf of New York, or something like that. And he does say that, that um, you know, that compared to certainly the West Coast and many other cities, New York has obviously been a much less many less highways, many more uh, in our transportation ratios. So I think that's a little Yeah, point. I mean, look, yeah. So we had the subway system and you had already a walking city. Um, 
So there were there were a lot of reasons why Moses was not going to do quite as much damage, um, but he also was stopped uh, from doing stuff. There was the highway that was going to go across Midtown, and of course the one. So uh, this is another palimpsest. So do you know um, you know what LaGuardia Place is? No. Okay. So um, you know people know that he wanted to put this highway through. What he wanted to do was essentially widen Fifth Avenue and create a highway. So why does LaGuardia Place look like that? This is right where I grew up, just two blocks away. That there's, that, there's that sort of community garden and that sort of setback and those low buildings when you get to West 4th Street and you know, just like below the park and so forth. Um, that's because that, that was being prepared and taken over by the Moses, um, the Tribal Authority, to, to put in this highway. Um, and, that, and the highway would have gone right through the middle of um, Washington Square Park. So, you know, there was the beginning of resistance to Moses in New York in ways that were less possible in some other cities. Um, what made it possible here? Well, as I said, I mean, I think it, there, was, there was just cultural factors for one thing. People did not see the need. They didn't necessarily think their neighborhoods didn't work. Um, there was a lot more sort of activist politics around urban um, affairs, including urban renewal. Um, and the city functioned with the subway and things. So, you know, if you're talking about cities, like I've been to millions of these cities, talking about Louisville or Tulsa, or a lot of other places, um, they're just not as dense. They don't have the same networks of, uh, you know, public transportation. They don't have subway systems at all. So it was, it's much easier to drive uh, highways through, through these areas. And you have much more sprawl. Um, so they, just, they just have a different sort of physical fabric. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, maybe yeah. Sort of one-ish more question. One-ish, okay. Uh, Can I ask a question? Sure, okay, sure. Uh, what are your favorite books about New York? Uh, and also, the second within that is favorite books, favorite books related to history and architecture. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah, I, that's funny. I mean, I don't actually have at hand. It's a really interesting question because I don't, I don't actually have at hand a bunch of things. I mean, I love Michael Sorkin's 20 Minutes book. Um, Michael was a wonderful writer, a friend, I, and, I, um, and I miss him, and I, and I think he's a wonderful guide to the city. He was. Cervic and principled and really interesting. Um, and, you know, yes, so, you know, Ken's books are really fascinating and also um, on the history of the city and, and so are Bob Stern's big books. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not fun reads, but I find myself looking through them because they're really useful. Because of my job, I think I've looked back on a lot of for other critics, previous critics. Adel, I grew up reading Ada Louise, who I've gotten to know. Um, Mumford, who I sort of despise, um, but was interesting. You know, oh, Mumford, I mean, not, a, not everything about him, but he, I think he really misunderstood the city in a lot of different ways. And he, you know, his idea of the city was the city beautiful. So he loved Forest Hills, which I do too, but he really didn't quite, I think, grasp. Um, the messiness of the city. Um, Marshall Berman is a really interesting writer on the city. Um, those are a few. There was something over here. Yeah. I was wondering about what do you think about the supertown building, which seemed to be our next generation in the building? Yeah. Can I ask that as a question? You know, the question was, what do I think of the super tolls? So let me ask it this way. Um, how many people here uh, dislike the super tolls? Interesting. How many people here like them? How many people here don't feel anything about them at all, that they're fine? So the majority of you don't like them. Why? I'll, I'll answer your question, but I'm just curious. But <laughs> when you don't see like the evolution, they're not like slightly taller than everything else around them, they're like dramatically taller. Than them. Uh -huh. So it's about their height. Yeah, relative, relative. 
they look precarious. That's the one that falls. Worried they're going to fall over? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're ugly. Yeah. And I do you think they're just ugly? Right? Yeah. I mean, the park, especially. It's a reservoir looking. Yeah. You don't like that? I hate, hate yeah. that, you know. I don't think they're that interesting. No. I mean, I okay. appreciate the, you know, the, what went into building. But right. I don't and most of them are probably empty. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's super wealthy. It's super, yeah. super wealthy. Yeah. Don't miss your Okay. Don't they oh. also cause the city to, um, to increase in its height? Oh, you know, they're making the city sink? Uh, yeah. But um, there was some story that came out recently about the cities. Don't pay attention to those stories. <laughs> um, so, were you going to say something too about why you don't like them or were you doing I wanted to ask you the development of what Oh, okay. But let me answer this question because I, I didn't answer the question. So, I've thought a lot about them. Um, at, and I think what I was asking, what I wanted to see was, did you feel that they were too tall? Did you feel that they were occupied by just wealthy absentee, you know, owners? Uh, was it that there was something about the relationship to the rest of the city? What, what, what is it that bugs people about them? Some people about them. Um, I just don't think they're attractive. They're, they come in different forms and there aren't that many of them. So, it's hard to generalize about them. No, I don't want to. Um, and that's not, that's an extremely unpopular thing to say, obviously. Mm -hmm. And people just don't, generally don't say it. I haven't made a point of saying it because I don't, um, I'll try to explain. So the city has had various versions of tall. <laughs> and there's nothing in, to me inherently problematic with tall. If we don't like tall, then really this is not the place to <laughs> So, and then I don't know what, so then what is tall? Tall is a relative term, like tall relative. So I mean, so okay, so maybe you could say they're too tall relative to the other tall buildings. Um, and they do, they do definitely stick up. It's worth remembering, by the way, that um, in, when the first buildings went up along Central Park South, they were extraordinarily tall, and there were complaints about the shadows, and this is just horrible. And, and now, of course, it's like, oh my god, these buildings are so much taller than those wonderful buildings along Central Park South, <laughs> which are so beautiful. And so, so that is normal. That has always been the case. Tall has always been something that people have had a vexed relationship with. To me, there is something um, weird and awesome, too, about just how much taller they are. <laughs> um, I think that's something. Some of them I hate. Um, some of them I think are, a couple of them I think are kind of interesting looking. Um, I, I think they all represent a certain sort of aesthetic moment that's not actually my favorite. But I, I don't think that they're all inherently um, bad. So then the question is, so if it's not height, um, what's the problem? And I think then you enter into a different discussion. They, um, they're obviously built for extremely wealthy people. Um, and they have no real relationship to the neighborhood they're in. Um, and um, yeah, the people who are living in them are not necessarily there. I mean, I get that. I don't, I don't know what to say about that. Like, I, I don't want people knowing when I'm in my apartment or not. So I don't really care as long as they're paying their taxes. Um, because the other reason you do this, right, is because those people are going to add wealth to the city, presumably. The biggest problem um, with them, I think, is just this question of, um, I think it's really that they symbolize inequity at its most extreme in the city. So there's something that bugs us about that, that, that the people who are some of the wealthiest people in the city are occupying our physical public space, that they're literally in our eye, you know, in our eye line, they're taking up at the sky. Um, and I think there is something to be said about that, that this is public space and we should have some 
ability to regulate what that looks like. I, but it's very complicated to do that. Um, to, to, who's to decide what things being supposed to be like? And, but I think that's it. It bugs us that super wealthy people are up there in the sky taking up <laughs> view of Center Park. And, and there is a problem with that. But just so you know, the reason that that that's are super wealthy is because it's it's impossible to build a building that tall, that high, at a cost that is, you can't build affordable housing that high. It just, <laughs> um, and I could go into the reasons why, but I mean, it's just, that's what happens. So if you're gonna build extremely tall buildings, the top of them are going to be for extremely wealthy people. Um, you know, New York does need extremely wealthy people in it. Um, and the one other thing I'll put in your head, not, again, I'm not, as you can tell, I'm not totally defending them, but <clears throat> for what it's worth, they exist only in certain places, for instance, along 57th Street, because the zoning there in 57th Street allows for the packaging of different sites together and without any height issues or whatever. And you do get wealthy people who live in those places. Some of those wealthy people are really, really bad people, but some of them are also people who would not be accepted at 10 Park Avenue or 1010, you know, Fifth or, or whatever, um, for lots of reasons. They're, you know, they don't come from the right place. They don't look right or whatever. Um, I mean, I don't mean to heroize them too much, but that's definitely a factor. There are extremely wealthy billionaires in the world who are not welcome in, you know, our, some of our buildings here on the east side, but they're perfectly welcome to buy a place there. So I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable entirely saying that they're inherently bad. Um, I think those buildings will come to look um, okay over time. Yeah. Um, not all of them. We have lots of crappy buildings that are 80 story high, 70 story high, which is part of the fabric of the city. <clears throat> so some of them will be okay and some of them won't. But one thing you notice they've done, and I'll stop, I know is that the, the city had a profile, which was quite interesting, where you had sort of at the very bottom, this very high, and then there was low, and then there was a little high, and then low. And now it's much more complicated. Uh, and it looks different from different angles. That's kind of interesting. Um, you know, it made me think about, about this particular conversation. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it was I'm, I'm in my twenties, and Avenue of the Americas is that was so different from everything else, and it was so modern. And right. It was a business street. Right. But still, I was like, I didn't like it back then. I'm like, oh, it's right. like, I don't like this street. Why right. is this street? You know, when right. obviously I knew, but the arch I've come to really um, appreciate, appreciate the architecture. It, yeah. That architecture. Yeah. And the vision from back in the day. Yeah. To build that. Yeah, I mean Park Avenue itself, which was you know. Was that for the first yeah. sort of you know the Madman Avenue? But there was a lot of people who were led. those had been very wealthy private homes, and then you get Lieber House and Seagrams and all yeah, these things right. which we consider the great monuments of new century time. modernism. Yeah. I'm not saying that these newest buildings will be the greatest, yeah. but they're not they're not all terrible. Yeah. Some of them are terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.